Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all to the fifth foundation level training session on innovation ambassador. And uh, also, I welcome Mr. Deepan Sau, Assistant Innovation Director at Ministry of Education and Innovation Cell. Uh, we have an expert speaker, Ms. Prajakta Gulkarni, uh, who will be speaking on application design thinking tools and approach for right problem identification and solution development. So she is the founder and chief design officer of an education technology startup at Nodes. Uh, she has delivered public talks on human-centered design, user experience design, and design thinking at various forums, including Head Start, IEEE Wheels, and the Goa Project. She has vast experience in working with the design process and its tools through various companies like Google, Ink Talks, Tech uh, Teach for India, D Labs at the Indian School of Business, Memesis Labs, and other such multinational companies. companies. In the last few years, she has extensively worked on education development by incorporating design thinking in learning models, as well as creating impactful credit design courses in various engineering and management colleges all over India. She has also been an adjunct faculty at IIM Bangalore for teaching a self-design course named Extended Design Thinking to the Executive Management and Public Policy Management. She is now working as a member of curriculum committee to introduce design thinking subject in CBSC and continues his dedication to working for teachers and building enjoyable teaching workflow through the notes learning platform. So I would like to welcome uh, our speaker. Uh, so you can carry forward your session, ma'am. Ma'am, you are muted. Thank you so much, Rudyan. Uh, let me just share my screen and uh, start right away. Right. So uh, I think I should just uh, start with the session and then eventually get into introducing uh, myself because Rudyan has already covered uh, almost all the points. Um, so uh, here's how today's session is going to be like. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to be mostly talking about design thinking uh, and uh, I'm going to show a few examples of how it is applied in various parts of education. Uh, most of my initial uh, half an hour is going to be spent on design thinking process, how it is used, what kind of tools there are in design thinking and then uh, we will do a small exercise uh, after which I will talk about design thinking in education and then uh, the last 10 minutes I will reserve for critical questions from uh, uh, either if we get any. Right, so uh, just to uh, brush over the basics uh, in the beginning of this uh, session, I'll talk about what is design thinking. Uh, design thinking is a, a method of creative problem solving. This is something that was um, this is something that all of us as humans have been using if you look at behavioral uh, characteristics, but um, design thinking has been coined by a lot of designers and a lot of even uh, scientists and innovators together to sort of help uh, help people start innovating using uh, using the ideas of logic, imagination, intuition, uh, systemic reasoning. All of it that can build a uh, all of it that can build something that benefits the end user as a uh, keeping the human in the center, while having an innovation that uh, that covers most of the areas of um, innovation that is uh, that is to do with viability, desirability, and feasibility. So uh, I'll you'll understand this better as I go ahead. So this is just for me to cover the basics. Where the design thinking lies in the middle of an analytical and intuitive thinking. So intuitive thinking makes uh, a lot of uh, gives you a lot of valid ideas, gives you a lot of in, gives you a lot of uh, innovative and creative ideas. And analytical thinking uh, gives you a lot of systemic ideas, gives you um, organized and sophisticated ideas. So design thinking falls in the middle of it, where uh, you can actually utilize both the parts of analytical and intuitive thinking. 
uh, what is design innovation? Is design innovation is what comes out of design thinking, I would say, but it is something that uh, uh, all of uh, it's a, something that combines viability, desirability, and feasibility all together. And uh, that's something that I will be focusing on in the next part of the session. So I'll uh, continue to talk about viability, desirability, and feasibility in the next part. Um, how is design changing the world? As you have seen and you must have uh, noticed uh, all of these, uh, uh, all of the uh, inf uh, fad that is coming through you uh, about design thinking. So um, you can see that a lot of, lot of major companies have used design thinking to create substantial amount of change and also uh, have uh, invested a lot of money in making sure that their industry is reskilled with design thinking and design abilities. So, um, I mean, uh, instead of giving, instead of me reading out the examples, you can read it out yourself. There's uh, a lot of money that is being invested into creating design thinking, human centered solutions is what design thinking um, is being used as, as a, in terms of both management as well as innovation science. Uh, IBM uh, in, has invested in creating something that, uh, that is a massive design organization that actually helps solve ground level problems. Infosys has been reskilling a lot of employees with design thinking every year in their Infosys campus and a lot of companies like PepsiCo, like Airbnb, Uber, a lot of new and scaling companies have been using design thinking to make sure that they solve their problems. Uh, for humans. So uh, design thinking is change in the world. Design is being uh, used, utilized to solve the ground level problems or to solve human level problems in any kind of system. And that's why the importance is growing uh, every day. And that's one of the reasons why I'm sure uh, design thinking is involved in this kind of a topic. <clears throat> uh, so let me get into uh, design thinking and innovations. Um, Let's talk about innovations, okay? So what is uh, one of the great innovations of man? And I'm sure that uh, what this picture <laughs> is showing you, you can imagine what I'm talking about when I say uh, a great innovation, right? So yes, so there is, uh, there's a wheel. So I'm talking about the wheel, yes. So <clears throat> what was the wheel invented for? Uh, a lot of you or most of you must uh, be thinking that it it is in, it was invented for let's say speed or um, transport or uh, any kind of a mechanical movement uh, and it's very close to something that it was originally invented for so wheel was actually invented and we always say that we invent the wheel which is like a, which is something that we use uh, constantly and that's why i i kind of wanted to go ahead with the concept of wheel in innovation itself and it was invented to actually make pots. So the first wheel that was invented was the potter's wheel. Now, how does the potter's wheel fall into this whole picture of design thinking and viability, desirability and feasibility? So um, uh, when I look at the potter's wheel, what I see is like uh, a, uh, a large round stone structure or a stone disc. Uh, which can be kept on top of a couple of stones and it can rotate itself or you can rotate it with a whatever stick or <clears throat> the movement that you can build along with it. Uh, on top of it, you can put a piece of clay or mud from nearby with some water and then using a lot of uh, physical movement, you can actually shape this into something that is utilizable uh, that has a multi-purpose usage and that has been used over generations and has been designed over generations, right? Uh, so that's why I look at the potter's wheel in terms of design thinking. So uh, to give you a broader idea of what I'm talking about, uh, does, uh, let's say that uh, not one person actually went to the potter and said that, hey, uh, I need something to drink water with. I'm sure that a lot of people went to the potter and or to went to a person who owns, uh, let's say, a lot of stones and said that I need to carry water or I need to store water. Um, I need to take uh, water from a well that is very far away and place it inside my house where my kids can drink from it 
uh, my wife can hold it or my uh, let's say my uh, elder parents can actually uh, utilize uh, water from it so and uh, so uh, what happened is that instead of uh, going at it one pot at a time a different pot for each person uh, this potter actually created something that can create multiple pots by multiple people so that's that's where my that's where the idea of viability comes from it works it solves the problem the need of the r is to have multiple pots in multiple households one uh, for the purpose of having uh, one for the purpose of uh, it getting utilized inside the house or outside the house or for water or for any kind of a solid or liquid to store but two also to kind of create a business opportunity for the end uh, for the person who's struggling and who wants to who has the ability to create this large disc out of stone and to just put a, a chunk of mud with water on it so that's that's where the viability factor comes in uh, what is feasibility feasibility is something that can be done within uh, your nearby uh, nearby resources or within the most affordable resources or whatever is locally available is what feasibility uh, talks about so uh, one of the reasons why feasibility is important is for the affordability factor but another reason why feasibility is important is because certain materials are found in certain areas because they sustain in those areas so for sustenance feasibility is very important the third and the most important factor that most of us kind of forget about or uh, uh, don't uh, talk about it enough uh, is the for the factor of desirability so what is desirability is the ability to ability of the product or the solution to feel good uh, we always focus a lot on viability and feasibility but desirability is something we always always miss out on and that is something that will that is going to bring out uh, the actual uh, utilization of the product so for example um, uh, for example if you let's say um, uh, let's say the pot was made out of something uh, which smells bad or the pot was made in in a squarish structure with that which does not look good inside the house or it had like small of small small stones inside it stuck all around it so it so it kind of uh, confuses the person of whether, whether they like it or not and that's why they would not choose to use it so you want people to choose to use it you have to focus on desirability a lot and uh, i always give the example of uh, cooking uh, in this case so for example you're making uh, making a meal for somebody you will usually make something that even if you are trying to make sure that they are they need to be it needs to be a highly nutritious meal you will make sure that it tastes good and it looks good so that these are the important desirability factor that solutions need to have and that we most of us forget uh, again so uh, this is uh, what uh, this picture actually is something that i was wanted to talk more about how historically uh, a lot of uh, historically this design of the pot or this design of the wheel has constantly changed and has come come down to us and we are still using it in various forms so uh, we need to make innovations that can be uh, that can be iterated that can be changed that can be uh, uh, created uh, that can be um, sort of uh, viable for that particular time that particular person that particular group of people and then when it changes that dimension of time space or uh, even the locality uh, the viability desirability factor can obviously change and sort of bring a new structure altogether to the solution that you have designed so the idea is to not to stick to one solution uh, fits all the people all over the world but create solutions that can actually improve and uh, impl get implemented in various places at their own pace at their own uh, with their own desirability and feasibility that is possible right to just revise what we are talking about is viability desirability and feasibility viability is the ability to work and survive which is very important feasibility is the ability to be conveniently done this is something that uh, as uh, this is something important even for production or even for uh, your affordance and then desirability is something that has the ability to feel good so uh, it uh, the reason why it is uh, uh, round shiny has 
a beautiful handle to hold is a is because it is desirable what happens in the absence of desirability is that uh, like i said uh, the the end uh, the user or your uh, or the person you are solving the problem for will lose interest in it any in uh, one day and then they will stop using it so for for you for it to sustain for it to please multiple people you need to make it desirable as desirable as possible what happens when it lacks feasibility is that uh, it uh, is that it is unaffor it's either unaffordable or it does not sustain in that environment so when we make objects that are that are actually going to be thrown in the garbage at the end of the day that's something that we need to uh, figure out in feasibility because then uh it is neither getting utilized over generations and it is neither a sol uh, you uh, neither being uh, friendly for the locality that they are living in so it has to be feasible no matter what and when we miss out on the viability factor all of us know what happens because it's uh, it's some it's the ability to work uh, and if it doesn't work then it is basically just a showpiece on the wall so even if it has feasibility and desirability if it does not work and it just looks beautiful then uh there's no point of buying it but yeah uh, in some cases and in some uh, areas yes people uh, people do enjoy uh, indulging into these areas so let's talk about how do we get these three factors of viability feasibility and desirability into our solution it's a very simple process okay so human centered design uh, is actually how uh, is actually something that i can use to describe design thinking so human centered design is here create and deliver okay so it's very simple to remember hcd human centered design here create deliver got it so uh, what is here create deliver you start by understanding and in uh, involving yourself into the situation getting uh, getting first hand information so this is where we collect a lot of information and most of you as researchers would understand this process of gathering a lot of information creating uh, a conclusion or a hypothesis uh, over a lot of information and then uh, formulating your insights and then create uh, and then finding out what the underlying problem is okay so that is the area of here the area where create comes in is where uh, after you understand what the problem is what the real problem is underlying then you start creating solutions over it and you present let's say 10 different solutions uh, on day 1 uh, maybe 20 different solutions on day 1 and then you shortlist what works what doesn't work and then you sort of get into a new creation mode of <laughs> making it together and then uh so on and so forth until you finally find out that this is one solution that can work for this one uh type of people uh in this one kind of region uh what happened once you have selected what kind of solution it is uh, the uh, the time has come to deliver so when it is uh, delivered it is actually implementation of your solution so there's a lot that goes into implementation right you have to uh on board people to use it you have to show them you have to make sure that uh, Uh, the desirability has reached its end point uh, and then the person is okay to buying or using whatever you have designed so that's that's a deliver phase which comes into picture and it's uh, it sort of involves a lot of lot of uh, validation on what kind of solution you are presenting and it uh, uh, brings about a lot of implementation efforts as in uh, what uh, can be a viable feasible and desirable form of uh, production for your solution for example um, if it's in uh, so let me just uh, talk about the entire process so here starts with empathizing uh, which is very important when we talk about human centered design you have to empathize with people uh, what happens is that uh, we read a lot of information about behavioral science uh, in books and in research papers but uh, the real empathizing happens when you meet the person uh, meet them in person uh you will understand what emotions they are going through what kind of uh, motivations they have what kind of um what kind of habits they have when you meet that person you won't understand this uh, just by reading about them but mainly uh, because researches are written at a certain point of time and psychology literally evolves every day so you have to understand uh what uh 
who, who you have to understand by putting yourself into their shoes. So that's empathizing. Then you understand what all uh, situation they are going through, what kind of uh, what kind of journeys they are on, where are the loopholes, where are the emotional drawbacks, and then sort of define what kind of problem there is. So define is a very important phase because this will change the outcome of everything else uh, ahead of it. So this is where you define what the underlying problem is. And to give an example, if you, for example, go to your doctor uh, and you say that I have a headache, uh, uh, you don't just uh, you don't directly ask for I have a headache, give me a combi flam. You, uh, the doctor will actually diagnose uh, and ask you several questions to understand what what problem you must be having internally to cause that headache, and then he will actually give you a medicine to solve that internal problem uh, rather than a direct headache, right? So you need to define what that internal problem is. The why of the problem has to be figured out to be able to solve the need of the hour uh, solution, uh, to give a need of the hour solution, I mean. So uh, then you ideate solutions. So if you have defined the problem right, the solution presents itself. Uh, and this is true with any kind of a, uh, any kind of a, uh, solution or innovation that you're trying to do. As soon as you know what the problem is, the underlying problem is the uh, solution will just start presenting and you'll come up with thousands and thousands of ideas to solve that problem. So um, I always say that don't stick with your ideas, don't stick with your innovation, stick to the problem and you will go, you will have a million ideas ahead. Uh, eventually you will have to prototype in the sense that you will have to break uh, make and break every time you have to experiment, start with very normal validation like a note written on a paper or a, a SMS that you send to somebody asking whether this is a good idea and then take it to a level where they can actually see, hold, use it in their hand in the minimum of cost and minimum of resources so that you are allowed to break it. You're allowed to uh, thrash it when it doesn't work out. So prototype using minimum resources. And then once you have the right prototype in front of you, make it better and better every level. So uh, make it uh, make it slightly more uh, convenient, easier to use, make the user experience slightly better, slightly better. And, and eventually you will be able to improve on it. Eventually you'll be able to implement it. And then once you implement it, you validate it. So when, when you have 100 people using something that you have innovated, then you want to go and ask them what is working and what is not. So I'm sure that the Potter's Wheel was not designed in like one day. Uh, and it has been changing over generations. Like even if you see the design of the pot, it has changed over generations. And that needs to happen with any kind of a solution that gets incorporated in this world. So you have to make sure that you continuously do this process with your innovation, no matter what kind of creativity that you bring into picture. So you, you empathize, understand, define, ideate, prototype, validate, implement, improve, and then you come back to empathizing, you come back to asking them questions, understand what they're going through, define each of the problems that they are having, ideate on those solutions, have prototypes, and then continuously validate, implement all of these, uh, all uh, implement your solution. Change it a little bit every time you ask questions and you you see how much your solution can evolve. Like treat it like a baby. <laughs> uh, so it's going to learn itself. It's going to grow and you need to make sure that innovation needs to grow. You can't just plug and play and then leave it, leave it as it is. So it's important to change it. Um, let me show you a small example uh, through a video of how... Um, uh, so to uh, about how to look for problems around you and uh, it's it's not very difficult we live in this world full of uh, humans especially in india and uh, there's people all over us uh, all around us there's uh, every system is run and governed and made by the people for the people so you understand that everything uh, everything will have some level of emotional uh, turbulences and that will cause some level of problem or the other and for uh, and all you have to do is make sure that you look around and make sure that you are looking at looking for the tiny tiny challenges and tiny tiny turmoils that everyone is facing around so uh, this is a small problem identification video that i'm going to just play sorry 
there's this door on the 10th floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. Damn it. You ever get this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. I hate this door. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? I feel like Roman Mars would know about this. This is 99% invisible. And those doors you made are called Norman doors. Um, what's a Norman door? Don Norman wrote the essential book about design. He is the Norman of the Norman door. All right, and where is this guy? You must go to San Diego. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Hey, I'm Don Norman. I'm... Gee, you know, it's hard to describe what I am. Well, he's been a professor of psychology, professor of cognitive science, professor of computer science, a vice president of advanced technology at Apple. But for our purposes... I was spending a year in England, and I got so frustrated with my inability to use the light switches and the water taps and the doors, even, that I wrote this book. If I continue to get the door wrong, is it my fault? No. In fact, if you continue to get it wrong, it's a good, but if other people continue to get it wrong, good sign that it's a really bad door. A Norman door is one where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do, or gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it. Why does it need an instruction manual? That is, why do you have to have a sign that says push or pull? Why not make it obvious? It can be obvious if it's designed right. There are a couple of really simple basic principles of design, and one of them I'll call discoverability. When I look at something, I should be able to discover what operations I can do. The principle applies to a whole lot more than doors. And it's amazing with many of our computer systems today, you look at it, there's no way of knowing what's possible. Should I uh, tap it once or twice or even triple tap? So discoverability, when it's not there, well, you don't know how to use something. Another is feedback. And so many times there's no feedback. You have no idea what happened or why it happened. And these principles form the basis of how designers and engineers work today commonly known as user or human-centered design. I decided at one point the word user was a bit degrading. Why not call people people? And it's amazingly simple and amazingly seldom practiced. We call it iterative because it goes around in a circle. We go out and we observe what is happening today. We observe people doing the task. And from that, we say, oh, we have some ideas. Here's what we should perhaps propose to do. Then you prototype your solution and test it. Quite often these are wrong at first, but each time we go around the circle, we do a better job of making the device until the point we're actually making something that really works. And this process has spread all over the world. And it turns out it's improving lives from better everyday things like the ones that Don wrote about to using the same process to solve huge problems in public health in developing countries, water, sanitation, farming, lots more. So would it be a better human-centered door? An ideal door is one that as I walk up to it and walk through it, I'm not even aware that I had opened the door and that's a flat plate. What could you do? Nothing. The only thing you can do is push. Now, see, you wouldn't need to sign. A flat plate, you push. This kind of push bar with the piece sticking out on one side works well too. So you can see what side you're supposed to push on. The vertical bars could go either way. A simple little hand thing, though, sort of indicates hold. But we still have terrible, terrible doors in the world. So many of them. There are lots of things in life that are fairly standardized, and therefore, whether I buy this house or not, it is not a function of whether it has good doors in it. And so, uh, except for safety reasons, doors tend not to be approved. But the tyranny of bad doors must end. I think that it's a really short design they put pull handles when it's a push. And that should be a flat panel right here. And not a pull handle. That's how I feel about stars. Very misleading. You're right, Becky. You're goddamn right. And if we all thought like you, well, we might just design a better world. Okay.
It won't open because it's a security door. Okay. Um, it says uh, any product that needs a manual to work is broken. So if you find somebody which who is misusing a product of how they are supposed to utilize it, then that's where you can find your problems. It's uh, problems are all around us. The idea is to make sure that we identify these problems and then we find the underlying need of the eye to maybe to eventually solve these problems with the right solution or the right uh, prototype for solution. So uh, let me explain this to you in the form of how uh, this famous man tried to use it. And uh, without like taking too much time, I'm going to tell you that this is uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, one of the great innovations of or one of the most uh, amazing innovations of man uh, and is still um, most amazing innovations is electricity and uh, the reason uh, the one of the uh, things that we always remember uh, it, it is by uh, the mark of the beginning of electrical age where uh, this tungsten filament bulb was designed and uh, was actually showcased in Menlo Park uh, on Christmas uh, day or Christmas week in like 1879. So um, we always remember him by this one little product that he actually designed. But what happened, what uh, what he actually did is with a lot of lot of team, a huge team of people and a lot of multidisciplinary team members who are experts at, let's say, understanding people who are lawyers, who are people uh, who are um, uh, who have an understanding of the environment, he sat with them and designed a way to transmit electricity in everybody's house. Because what you can understand is by looking outside is that the darkness actually was inside the house of the person. So the all the uh, effort that he actually put in was in transmission and his approach of looking at how transmission, how electricity can be transmitted one, without by making it uh, desirable right and two by making sure that it remains feasible and viable throughout ages uh, was a very uh, beautiful approach about uh, how he uh, approached this problem of uh, not having electricity at home and then made sure that it uh, that the solution that he uh, presented with the transmission circuit uh, design was something that would uh, solve the problem of uh, of electricity being a major hazard as well, right, for the people. So if you have the time and if you have the energy also, please read into this uh, example of uh, design, how Edison used uh, design thinking into his approaches. Uh, with the next 10 minutes, I want you to do a small activity. This is something very important for you to understand uh, or how design thinking works and how we can utilize it. Also important to sort of uh, help students understand uh, what kind of, uh, what goes into design thinking and how our design thinking process is actually utilized. Uh, what I need you to do is uh, grab a piece of paper and a pen to, for this activity. Also, uh, if you're sitting online, then uh, maybe have a friend or somebody who you can uh, on the side who you can chat with immediately or maybe call or if there's somebody in your house then that's uh, that's the best partner to have so if you can talk to somebody one person whoever is around you then grab that person for like the next 10 minutes or five minutes of this activity uh, let me just dive right into it uh, i'm sure all of you are sitting with a uh, pen and paper so we'll just start with the first part and then till then uh, rest of you please arrange for one person to talk to. So the first three minutes, what I want you to do is uh, sketch an ideal wallet uh, according to you. So uh, use three minutes and a pen and a paper to sketch an ideal wallet on, uh, on your piece of You can uh, majorly use drawing to show what can what can be an ideal wallet and then uh, whatever remaining time there is used to sort of label what uh, ideas you get about this wallet how it needs to be how, what kind of a amazing wallet uh, it can be okay so use three minutes to sketch an ideal wallet i'm putting my timer on for two minutes so after two minutes i'll just um rem i'll just remind you what is going and uh, yeah, your time starts now. So you have three minutes 
to sketch an ideal wallet. Wallet because most of us always, most of us use wallet still. Uh, some of us have started using online wallets, so you can also try and uh, redesign what you think of an uh, ideal online wallet also. But try and stick to a wallet uh, as an idea of what you think a wallet should be. Uh, and uh, use up this these three minutes to make sure that all your ideas can be incorporated into this one design uh, that can be the most ideal wallet. Think about uh, the smallest of areas where you would like to be creative and innovative in this. This is one minute down. So after two, after one more minute, I'll explain to you the next part, and then you can continue doing this. Right. Uh, the activity was in three minutes, you, have to, you had to sketch uh, an ideal wallet onto a piece of paper using your pen or pencil. Um, try not to make it too elaborate, just make sure you stick to your creativity and what you think should be an ideal wallet. Right, so we are down one minute. Uh, I'm going to talk about the next part of this activity. Uh, uh, until then, you can continue marking down or writing down the uh, labels on your diagram or the drawing that you have made. So you have to use the next three minutes to talk to your friend or your partner, whoever you can talk to immediately, actually, whoever is uh, accessible to you right now, uh, and talk to them about their wallet. Uh, ask them various ideas about their wallet. You, because you have only three minutes, stick to uh, stick to only one or two questions and then try and get maximum information back from them. So the idea is to utilize time to get gather more information, so let them talk more, okay? So you have three minutes. I'm starting the timer in now. So three minutes talk to a person, you can chat with them, you can call them, you can maybe, uh, if there is somebody who's inside your house or wherever you're sitting right now, maybe you can just ask them. Just try and talk to them about their wallet. Don't ask about, uh, don't ask intimate questions. Try and uh, talk only about the areas which you think uh, are important in terms of a wallet. So you can talk about, you can ask something like uh, about the problems, uh, maybe preferences, uh, maybe what kind of history they have had with their wallets. Try and stick to limited questions, but make sure that they they give you a long, long answer about it. Okay, so you have uh, approximately one minute, uh, approximately two minutes, two and a half minutes remaining on this. So go ahead and talk to them. Keep your sketch of the wallet aside. Don't show to show it to them or. Uh, don't involve them into the uh, sketch that you have made. Just talk to them about their wallets and maybe what is an ideal wallet in their uh, uh, in their mind. That's one minute down. After another minute, I'll explain the next part. So all those who did not hear, I'm just going to repeat that you are going to talk to your friend about their wallet, okay? Ask them about what they think about their wallet or uh, maybe ask them about problems related to their wallet. Just talk to another person, whoever is around you, whoever is accessible to you about their wallet. Wallet is because uh, it's a common topic and something that you can actually uh, get a lot of people or any person around you to talk about. 
uh, except for kids. Maybe they have opinions as well. Okay, so we're down another minute. And just gonna wait for 30 seconds for you to finish talking. Right, so stop talking to whoever and then uh, and try and pay attention to what I'm saying about the next part of this because this is the most important or the challenging part of the exercise. So in two minutes, uh, I want you to sketch an, a wallet for that person. Okay, you can sketch one wallet, you can uh, give five ideas about the wallet, uh, you can also um, draw the most important part of the wallet and then write down the other features that you can include. So in the next two minutes, you have to sketch a wallet for that person, for whoever you spoke to right now, for your friend uh, or, or whoever you had a chat with or whoever you, you spoke on the phone with about your wallet. Okay, so for the next two minutes, uh, talk to them about, uh, for the next two minutes, sorry, pardon me, sketch a wallet for that person. Okay, so I'm starting the timer now. So we have two minutes to sketch this. Whatever you have understood by talking to them, uh, try and incorporate it into the sketch that you are making uh, so that uh, when you actually show it to them, they will give you more information about whether they like it or not, okay? So try and sketch a wallet for them, how they will use it and what all uh, they can do with it uh, in terms of what you understand from them about their wallet. You can continue to do this activity with a lot of, lot of more objects around you to make sure that you practice design thinking at home. But um, there are the other, uh, but uh, this is mainly important for uh, us to understand how design thinking works today. So just to repeat, you have two minutes uh, to sketch a wallet for the person you spoke to about their wallet right now. So you have one minute down. Uh, make sure that you're completing your diagram or sketch now. Uh, and if there's something that you are finding difficult to draw, just start labeling it. it it's easier, but uh, the fastest form of communication is by drawing or by sketching. So make sure that you uh, quickly, quickly learn, uh, quickly draw what you think about a, a, how a wallet should be for that. That's 30 seconds remaining for you. Of course, you can continue doing this uh, even after the session. But uh, for now, it's 10 seconds. And uh, that's it. So if you look at your wallet that you sketched as an ideal wallet in the first three minutes, and then you look at the new wallet that you have sketched for your friend, you can understand the difference between uh, you using design thinking and uh, not using design thinking, for example. So uh, when you utilize something uh, as important as human-centered design approach, uh, you have more confidence in the innovation that you have created after you have uh, empathized with, the, with a person and after you have empathized about what kind of um, what kind of motivations that person can have about uh, the problem that you're trying to solve for them? Uh, this happens through this is a uh, this is a process of discovering, defining, developing, and uh, delivering. So make sure that uh, uh, make sure that you utilize all of these parts uh, efficiently to make sure that your solution has uh, it has all the necessary viability, feasibility, and desirability involved in it. Uh, this is a, a 4D or a double diamond process that was designed uh, a while ago by 
one of the journalists who are trying to study how design process is already there. So uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the four point process of uh, design uh, and how it is uh, embedded into the, how it is utilized through the double diamond approach. Okay. So uh, like the initial diagram that I showed you where we were talking about here, create and deliver uh, in that we talked about how the first part is about uh, hearing and understanding and then defining and then developing and delivering. So these are the concepts that are being broken down into four parts of the process. And then this process that is iterative is given this beautiful uh, double diamond diagram that kind of helps us understand how what information goes in and how what information comes out to give you the right solution or the concept approach. So in the, uh, as you can, if you can see that there is one that there is this uh, double diamond, which is in the form of an infinity loop. So you know that uh, you can actually go from any phase to any phase at any point. So you can actually go from deliver to define and discover to develop uh, without uh, having to, uh, be, uh, <clears throat> without having to um, uh, use every each and every part, but making sure that you can, even if you're skipping, you're coming back to it. You're making sure that even if you go to de developing your prototype first, you come back and you make sure that uh, the need of the hour or the problem that you have started focusing on is getting solved by the prototype that you are designing. So uh, the idea is, uh, so one is that you can see that there are these four parts of the double diamond. There's discover, there's define, there's develop, and there's deliver. And uh, the second is that you can see that there are these triangles on both sides. Now, what these triangles signify is um, uh, is the diverging and converging of information. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that discover is the phase where you converge, is where you get in maximum of information in, uh, from all of your sources, and define is where you narrow down and you converge onto one single concept, one single problem. Again, develop is a, uh, is a place where you prototype and you maximize on your ideas, maximize on your solutions, prototypes. And then again, uh, for deliver, you come back and narrow down on a few concepts and prototypes to go ahead, validate, implement, and improve. So uh, this is what it means in the diverging and converging aspect. And one of the areas what uh, makes this more amazing is that you need to make sure that you come back to discover and if you can't deliver, uh, if you are not at the end of uh, it, as in the deliver phase, you evolve it and you make sure that you change what you're making and you utilize what you are learning, adjust certain parts of your prototype and then come into the, uh, come back into the discovery mode where you are understanding back from the users or your people, whether it works for them or not. So <clears throat> utilizing this double diamond approach helps us uh, sort of go uh, every step and sort of make sure that we are diverging and converging with information at every point and we are not just uh, going half a hard in all over the place, okay? Um, right, so um, this is a place where I was going to, um, I was going to spend 15 minutes to talk about uh, characteristics of a design thinking educator, but uh, because we are running a little short on time, I'm going to spend just five minutes and then whatever kind of questions you might have, you can ask after that. Right. So um, characteristics of a design thinking educator. Design is not something just for designers. And there's something that you must always understand that we, we as humans, we have designers, we are creators. Uh, we've always been innovating since we are wise beings. So we have always been innovating since the dawn of time. So you should not uh, divide people into creators and non-creators. So if you can, if you can design one thing, you can design everything. And this is a very famous quote by um, a very famous designer called as Massimo Vignelli. Uh, he's an Italian designer and one of the uh, things that he's famous for is designing this font, which is Helvetica. But other than the designing the font, Massimo Vinelli has designed a lot of things, like literally a lot of, lot of different things. So he's designed the metro routes, he's designed maps, uh, he's created a lot of books, uh, he's, this, uh, he's also uh, designed a lot of products out there. So Massimo Vinelli uh, actually lives by what he says. So he says that if you can design one thing, you can design everything. Because design at the end of the day is actually just solving a problem and then presenting it with the right solution, right? So you just need to be good problem solvers to be able to design something. 
uh, first characteristic is to remain human centered, to make sure that uh, you are doing it for the people and you're not doing it just for a, a certain kind of a, a objective, which is not going to fulfill anything for, a, for the human that is sitting in the middle of it. Uh, for example, if you're solving something for a child inside your, for a student inside your class, make sure that you understand them thoroughly before you give them something, uh, before you uh, give them a solution which they will not uh, utilize and understand, just will be able to look at it and uh, see difference. And this is a important picture that talks about how different people have different abilities and different levels of understanding. And so whenever you have a change in your system, when a new batch comes in or a new type of student comes in, you have to interact with them differently. So that's a characteristic and one of the examples that uh, falls into this is the Angie play uh, uh, curriculum from China where they, uh, they saw a lot of street kids interact with a lot of objects on the street and instead of getting those kids from the street and making them sit inside a boring classroom filled with chairs, they actually got them outdoors and built a lot, built a whole curriculum over what all they can learn by just playing outdoors. So that is why it is called uh, NG Play because it's it's a whole uh, curriculum based on playing outdoors. Uh, second is being non-judgmental and ambiguous. This is very important so that you can deliberate on what ideas. Uh, uh, on ideas before you pass any judgment on them or, or before you discard any idea, uh, you are actually giving it a second thought, even if it is a completely bizarre idea. So make sure that there is, uh, there's, the focus is on maximizing information, maximizing ideas, uh, maximizing prototypes, and the focus is not on uh, discarding what does not work. So that's one thing that des uh, in design you have to make sure that you follow. And uh, one of the examples that uh, I've uh, given for this particular uh, characteristic is the green school in Bali. So uh, when it comes to climate change, it's a very difficult and important topic. But uh, instead of putting it in the curriculum and writing it down, these guys actually reformed the entire school into uh, a bamboo architectural school and you can read more about it online uh, how they have actually created the sense of uh, responsibility within their students by actually changing how the school looks right so it's an idea that most of the schools would have discarded saying that i'm not changing my building but these guys did and that's how uh, you need to be uh, you need to defer judgment. You need to be non-judgmental and be ambiguous about, be vague about it so that eventually when you have the final solution, you are happy with it. You need to be a troublemaker or a rule, a rule breaker, which is very important uh, to find ideas. You, you, if you are a conformist, then it is very difficult for somebody to, uh, for you to look and observe problems around you. If you're a conformist, you think that everything is just functioning right and disciplined manner, and you're not really, so, you're not really looking for problems. You're actually looking for solutions. So try and be a troublemaker. Or break the rules. Get out of comfort zones. Get your students out of comfort zones and get them into the problem solving mode where they can actually uh, imagine creativity and then they can get into growth and they can understand concepts better. Uh, there is this nice um, film uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, about um, Robin Williams' uh, Dead Poets Society. And uh, if you have the time, please do go, go for it and watch it. Uh, Dead Poets Society, there's a very beautiful scene where uh, Robin Williams explains how uh, if, if even if you start walking together, there's a chance that you'll conform to each other's steps. But the but what makes you a rule breaker or a troublemaker is uh, is when you have your own style of walk and you can think in terms of how uh, how differently you can uh, do things and how differently you can create something. So that's something that will bring innovation to your mind. That is something that. Uh, will help you understand that even if you break one rule because you're solving a major problem, uh, you can actually utilize the rule breaking to make sure that this problem is solved uh, in a better manner and learning is taking place. Um, four is finding the right problem through curiosity and this is something that you need to embed in your students as well. <clears throat> and a very nice example is uh, of Finland's 
educational system where uh, students are actually given uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of focus given on entrepreneurial skills or entrepreneurial education where students actually have to have to come up with innovative solutions for problems that are around them, or for, around their environment, around their society, buildings, inside their house for themselves. So any kind of problem that they can solve uh, is given points, is given importance. And at the end of the year, the country actually makes a list of uh, how many schools uh, uh, have shown uh, entrepreneurial uh, solutions and they actually uh, accredit their students based on uh, their entrepreneurial spirits, even in their younger ages. So it's important to instill this uh, understanding of finding the right problem and being curious throughout to be able to solve problems through what they are learning. The fifth and the most important part is being multidisciplinary and being collaborative. And um, this is a nice quote by Peter Skillman, who has created uh, this uh, uh, these five characteristics. He says that enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the lone genus. And this is something that uh, mostly all the scientists and all the innovators and inventors that we know have always stood by. Um, make sure that you have a lot of lot of people and lot of lot of iterations before you actually come into something. Uh, this uh, has come into design thinking from a multi-cropping uh, theory of agriculture where you can actually put different crops in the same land so that all crops have a different, uh, so that all crops can benefit from each other and can grow together to, you know, also benefit the land as well as the air. So there is uh, this, uh, this thought has actually been incorporated in the Sanford's uh, classroom design where they make sure that... Uh, the center of the classroom is not the teacher, but the center of the classroom is actually the problem that they are solving or the concept that they are learning. And then different types of students are ma made to sit together, different uh, expert students are made to sit together who have different skills so that all of them can contribute and all of them can grow together. Uh, the sixth characteristic is to be empathetic and to, and to have holistic observation. Uh, by holistic, I mean that you need to be in, uh, you need to have internal observation as well as external observation. So there's, uh, there's a lot to observe when you look at, look around and there's a lot to empathize with uh, when you talk to people. So I'm sure that uh, this pandemic has made you uh, slightly bit more empathetic than before. And uh, I, I'm just pushing you to sort of practice it on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, that's what has empathy and uh, uh, emp uh, empathy and curiosity or empathy and observation has is what has solved a major education problem in the uh, Kakuma refugee camp, which uh, you can read about where these kids who live in the refugee camps, over 2 lakh uh, of them, or don't have any access to uh, the real world or to see how the real world functions. And that is something that is majorly incorporated in their curriculum because of empathy and how they how students could learn from it. The seventh part is iterative, and this is something that I have already talked about. How you need to make sure that you change something, that you iterate over it, and how you need to carry it out throughout uh, the range of time. Um, one of the areas which I can talk about is this is where we uh, actually worked on it so we when we designed our courses and when we uh, delivered it we actually uh, got feedback we actually measured impact uh, in terms of even skills that the students were achieving and then eventually we sort of bettered each and every smaller and smaller parts to uh, to make sure that we have a a thorough structure which has multiple dimensions to it which which involves skills as well as uh, abilities together uh, another example of iterative is uh, Ranjit Gisley's textbook revolution, which all of us must already know how he actually utilized his uh, problem or uh, the problems that they were facing in his uh, towns and villages uh, and then uh, utilize his skills and the people around him to be able to uh, deliver the right learning tools to the students. Uh, this is something that has gone has taken a long time and if you see that it, what is what it is today it might not be what it is after four years so you have to make sure that so you have to understand what all he actually did and what kind of uh, solutions he came up with what kind of prototypes he did not do and then now where this uh, revolution has taken him so you have to make sure that 
uh, there is this uh, uh, there is this understanding of iterative uh, behavior that you go back and you check whether it works every time. So even if you're conduct if you know, if you're giving a solution to your students or even if you're mentoring your students uh, about some nice innovation that they have developed, you're totally convinced that people will use it. You should make sure that they go back and ask the people whether they will use it or not, and that is what will keep them uh, in the iterative mode. This is a small home assignment, uh, which I would like you to do uh, is called as <clears throat> me through the looking glass. Um, this is something that will help you build self awareness as well as build empathy. Uh, what you can do is uh, click uh, one. So all of you are sitting around a desk or you must have a personal space in your house, uh, which you think you belong to. Uh, or even in your office, whichever area you think you're most comfortable with and click four or five pictures of the most personal items to you. So maybe it's your notebook, maybe it's your diary, maybe it's your bag, <clears throat> maybe it's a photo of your kids on your desk. Click four or five pictures of uh, uh, of who you are, that, that how, of how you can show who you are through the place where you sit or through a, a place where you are inside. Uh, what will happen is uh, you will see how small things define your habits and uh, how small things define uh, the uh, uh, this define the personality you have, and then you can actually relate these small things to other people's uh, objects and other people's personal spaces, and then uh, try and empathize with them more uh, by just observing their environment. So this is a nice uh, activity for you to sort of energize into un understanding yourself as well as understanding a person uh, uh, after this activity, right? Um, that's more or less about it. Uh, uh, and um, I'm going to open this up to questions. One of the questions that was really nice was asked in the last uh, session was uh, uh, whether community level problem uh, problem solving is better than global problem solving and the answer is yes uh, community level problems are always very uh, easier to solve because you experience them firsthand and global level problems are always solved when you start experiencing them when you go there and start uh, uh, solving each and every problem right uh, that's more or less thank you so much for your time thank you so much for listening this is me All right, so I think there are no questions, but I'm uh, going to end my talk here itself. Should I stop sharing? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Thanks so much. So thank you. Thank you, Pradakta, for uh, giving a detailed uh, uh, overview and also detailed presentation on design thinking and how design thinking can be aligned with human-centered design because design thinking, it is now very commonly used word and everybody is trying to uh, um, uh, justify that they are using the design thinking approach, but so far it, there is no human centered approach or human centered uh, design. Then I think that design thinking also is not going to much meaningful because after all, what you are going to design, it is for somebody others to solve their problem, right? Or it should, they should, even though it is any, any product is solving the problem, so far, it is not uh, well accepted by that person, like in terms of. Uh, take a minute. Okay. Mute, mute for uh, Udyan. Okay, so design thinking has wide application, but so far it will not aid the human centered approach. Then, then I think there is uh, uh, less meaning it carries uh, of using that tools. So you have nicely covered that human centered approach and also one thing that I am really uh, 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 happy to know about the different distinguishing features of the design thinking experts. Generally, uh, this is the part generally we never uh, uh, think about in detail when uh, we are we are trying to include the design thinking in our curriculum, but also in the curriculum, when it when you are adding some design thinking, no doubt the curriculum also looks very good and also much uh, approachable. Similarly, the person who is going to deliver also the characteristics of that person also needs to be included or inculcated. Then only 
he will able he or she will able to deliver that new content in a better way so uh, there is a need of changes both at the personal level also at the curriculum level and uh, we should uh, make use of design thinking in such way that we will help each and every person to go and find out a identify a problem even though it is uh, it may be a local it may be regional it may be a global problem but identify a problem and there should be one user of that problem that means the problem that you are going to identify should have there is some user and who is actually having facing that problem that this is the problem it, it should not be problem of uh, uh, only that you feel if even though it is your problem you have to go and validate that the same problem is faced by the others also through that through the through an activity prajakta is trying to explain or he try to explain that when you design a wallet on your own assuming something and when you approach the design thinking approach and you go and ask through empathetic way you go and ask a person and take their views and then you design a something for that person and when you are trying to compare these two there is a lots of changes like like and uh, this is the actually where design thing comes in and design thing says that you ha you have to first understand the others problem others mind others view and accordingly you have to come and you have to use your ingenuity capacity to design or to come up with a solution which will carry your identity also it is going to solve the others problem in a better way so this is the what uh, you know, today's session is all about and i really think about uh, uh, yes we got projecta we got some good questions so uh, how it is uh, how, how it is differ from our conventional design uh, design system and what is the meaning of human centric design thinking so these two questions we got projecta are you there projecta your uh, internet you are... yeah, the networking some issues please confirm uh okay udyan so i think uh, because of some network issue projecta is not able to join uh, it is showing some error some network error so uh, let's conclude the session okay sir so thank you so much for a wonderful session on design thinking so here uh, i hope by this session many of our participants have, have gained the knowledge on and will implement it in the field of innovation so thank you once again ma'am for sharing your valuable time with the participants and thank you deepan sir for encouraging their teams and other participants also thank you everyone for attending the session uh, now you can submit your assessment uh, after the end of this video thank you thank you thank you for every thank you for joining